Uh, so I will just read these off. Um, the Museum of New Art would like to thank everyone on the panel. Well, I, I'm saying that. I haven't said that, but I'll say it anyway. For particip <laughs> participating today and also uh, to those of you in the audience who've given up your Sunday afternoon to join us in this important discussion. The next major event uh, for Mona will be the inaugural opening of its Detroit Satellite Gallery in the Russell uh, Building, in the Russell Industrial Center. This year's noted artists, um, Christo and Jean-Claude, received the museum's Prince Horn Prize for a Lifetime Achievement. On Friday, December 11th, Mona's Detroit Annex will be hosting a photo survey of Christo and Jean-Claude's work from recent years. Uh, the 40 signed prints on ex exhibit will be offered for sale at $350 each. The reception will be from 6 to 9 p.m. The couple's latest project is titled Over the River, a river canopy to be constructed in Colorado beginning in early 2010. Next uh, autumn, Mona's, Mona Detroit is planning to mount a group exhibition of the other five Prince Horn Prize winners, Nicole Isserman, Olaf Bruning, Jess, Jessica Stockholder, Tracy Eamon, and Dana Schultz. So uh, I'll let me just now transition into uh, the discussion. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, I think, um, the panelists will, will just briefly introduce themselves, uh, themselves, and then that will be followed by um, a talk for about five or ten minutes. They're going to be talking about issues that have come out of, uh, I'm sure, reading the uh, Breeding Ground catalogue. And um, I don't think we'll, I'll be saying too much to them until after each panelist has given their their little speech and then I will be asking specific questions and after that uh, for, for about 20 minutes I think uh, we'll be dis discussing stuff and then we probably open it up to the floor. So I'm going to start with uh, Vince Carducci because he, uh, he's he got some uh, visual material for us to look at and we can we can look at that first. So uh, welcome, welcome Vince Carducci. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I'd rather not use the microphone if I don't have to. Um, I thought the way I would start would be to kind of take off a little bit from what I had done uh, in the catalog. In a certain sense, I may repudiate certain parts of that essay and also um, build on some things that I found in the, in the other essays, and specifically Michael Stone Richards, and then also picking up on what was Rebecca's last article for the Metro Times in which she talked about what I thought was a pretty interesting idea for art in Detroit. And so, in order to set that up, what I want to do is to take us back, um, people here are familiar with Michel Foucault. Uh, when, whenever people asked Foucault what he was up to, he would say, I'm, I'm busy writing an archaeology of the present. And so, what I want to do is something similar to that, give us an archaeology of the present. And to do that, we really need to start, in my opinion, with Rosalind Krauss's essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field. Uh, Krauss starts that essay showing this image, Pavilions and Decoys by Mary <coughs> Lewis, and says, how do we understand this as sculpture? This is late 1970s. Her answer to that question is we can't, because we know what sculpture is. Sculpture is this. Right, it stands up, it's a monument, typically it has a residue in the monument, uh, in significant places and people. And it isn't until the, uh, the, the modern period that sculpture starts to move away from that conventional definition to what she calls its neuter. And we first see that, according to Krauss, in this sculpture by Rodin, uh, his portrait of Balzac, in which we're starting to move away from that monumental uh, perspective and going what will eventually become the non-site. Sculpture as not landscape, not architecture. It's double, uh, the double negative. <coughs> uh, the epitome of that uh, in her reading uh, starts with Brancusi, and we still see the residue of the monument. The, 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 the uh, pedestal is there, the, which separates the artwork, quote unquote, as the sacred from the profane world in the same way that a monument uh, does, does that kind of a work. So, uh, what she then does is to set up this semiotic square to say, well, we understand that sculpture is not landscape and not architecture, that's the neuter. What if we were to flip that and 
um, talk about its complex conditions, landscape and architecture. And so she gets this, Mark's site. This is landscape, not landscape. Of course, the Suvaro is the spiral jetty. No, no. <laughs> or not the Suvaro, I'm sorry. This is the spiral jetty. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have any notes. And I had to rush from finishing vacuuming the upstairs. <laughs> uh, anyway. So Smithson Spiral Jetty, uh, Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial as the site construction which exists in that space between landscape and architecture, both landscape and architecture. The axiomatic structure, Carl Andre's uh, uh, installation in which it exists in that space between architecture and not architecture. And then finally, we still have sculpture and that is uh, represented in, in, by, uh, in Krauss's essay by this piece by Yael Shapiro. What I want to do now is to take a step back and start looking at this notion of the monument of, of space and place. And in America, if you uh, read a really excellent book, Public Sculpture and the Civic Ideal by Michelle Bogart, she starts talking about the period after the, the, the Civil War, in which uh, the monument makes its presence known as a way of uniting America as an imagined community after the ruin of the Civil War. How do we do this? Now, this is the same period in which industrialization is taking place, in which many people are coming from other countries, so the, the paranoia of mongrelization, miscegenation, are, are issues that are uh, in the public sphere. We have examples of that in Detroit, and, and I talk about this in the essay a little bit, the most important being uh, John Massey Ryan's Victory in Progress from 1902, uh, which was done to commemorate the bicentennial of the founding of Detroit. And essentially to put this Republican ideal out there of what it means to be an American. For, in particular, for all of those teeming masses who are coming from Ireland and Italy and, and need to somehow integrate into our society, become part of the, of the American way. Now, uh, the non-site and the memorial or the commemorative have intersected, not always with good results. Uh, probably the most well-known example being Richard Serra's Tilted Art. Excellent aesthetic solution, not so excellent social, political solution. Uh, we have done a good job of it, of course, in a very kind of contained space, Christo and Jean-Claude, the gates of Central Park, which are, you know, the, the purest kind of modern sculpture, absorptive, uh, you know, transforming, a uh, particular site, and then these are just some shots. I don't know how many people got a chance to see it when it was up, but it was quite magnificent. And uh, having lived in New York during that period, the way that it brought the community together was, was pretty interesting. Um, and that I would call a kind of top-down management. And really, public sculpture has had that kind of a, a thing happening with it. It has to go through a series of hoops in order for it to enter the public domain. 